Okay, welcome everyone to session 9A, which is the third in a series of our introduction talks. My name's Jenny Bryan. I'm going to be chairing this session. We have four 20 minute talks coming, and slight change from the schedule. The first two are recorded, but all of our speakers are here with us today. So we will watch a talk, maybe have time for some questions watch a talk, we have time for some questions, and then we'll have two live talks. Um, and then I also want to make sure everyone knows that if you have questions for the speakers, please use the Q&A feature within Zoom. You could also have a live discussion over in the Slack channel inside the lounge uh, for our session, which is talk underscore r underscore production underscore three. And that would also be a good place to discuss talks and some questions might get transferred from there. Otherwise, the last thing I want to remind you about before we start is that um, after this session, there is sort of the closing ceremony of the conference. And we'll make sure that we end on time so you can go there. Um, otherwise, without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, Aaron Jacobs, talking about production metrics for R with the open metrics package and we will queue up that video now. Hi, my name is Aaron Jacobs, and I work on the R&D team at Crescendo Technology in Toronto, which is a company focused on the technology side of the sports betting industry. And today I'm gonna to be talking about production metrics and monitoring with R, specifically with the new open metrics package. Now the inspiration for this talk comes from a general trend that I've seen in the R community over the past few years. As all of you know, R is a language that has traditionally been used for interactive data analysis, exploration, visualization, modeling, and it's excelled in those domains. But with the introduction of application frameworks like Plumber and Shiny, R is now being used to write genuine applications. Applications that have users other than their authors that are running in some kind of production. Now, I think that overall, this has been really, really beneficial for the R community. It's really increased the sort of range of things that R users can create and increase the value that they can bring to their organizations or companies. But with these new opportunities come new responsibilities. Specifically in this case, now that we have these applications, how do we keep them running? How do we know when they're misbehaving or broken or when they need more resources so that our users can rely on them. As usual, the answer is collect data. And we can start with generic data our system already supports, things like uh, CPU and memory usage. But generic measures like these are fundamentally limited. They don't really know anything about what's happening inside of our application. So for instance, if your R code is using a bunch of CPU, does that mean that it's broken? Or does that mean that it's working? What you really want is R to be able to admit metrics in its own right. Things you might need to know are things like uh, how many users are currently using your Shiny application. Is your Plumber API producing errors? Or perhaps is it producing more errors than usual? If you're querying a database, Maybe you want to know how long that takes. Maybe you want to know if the amount of time it takes is increasing. These data are called metrics. And the discipline of tracking and visualizing and responding to problems that are surfaced by these metrics is called monitoring. Now these are all old problems. <laughs> and there are tons of proprietary monitoring solutions out there, some of which have been around for decades but none of them, to my knowledge, have ever supported R. So what about the open source ecosystem? There are really two big um, open source monitoring projects. The first is Stasty and Graphite, um, and the second is Prometheus. Both of these have been around for a while, although Prometheus is a little bit newer. Prometheus uses a pull-based model which means that Prometheus itself is responsible for finding your application 
and asking it for its metrics. It's currently the tool of choice in the Kubernetes ecosystem, uh, and it definitely has more project momentum behind it at the moment. At Crescendo, we were originally targeting Kubernetes, so using Prometheus made a lot of sense. Since we started using this about a year ago, we now run or monitor dozens and dozens of Plumber APIs and Shiny applications, and even some stream processing workloads with Prometheus. We use these metrics to create monitoring dashboards and generate alerts when things go wrong. The open source outcome of this work is the open metrics package, which is already available on CRAN. You can install it today. It's a complete and slightly opinionated client library for Prometheus. And it's actually named after the Prometheus data format, which is currently in the process of becoming the open metrics specification for the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is the same group of people that standardize things like HTTP. The open metrics package allows you to create custom metrics for your R code. To give a more concrete example, suppose you have a Shiny application that accepts user uploaded CSVs. This could be a very important measure of load on your application because if users are uploading lots of CSVs, it may impact the service for others. So you probably would want to count it. So this is what it looks like to create a counter using the open metrics package. Um, there's a counter metric function and all you have to provide is a name and a little bit of human readable help. And then somewhere buried in your reactives in your Shiny application, you wanna increase the counter when a user actually uploads a CSV file. Now there's lots of good advice out there on how to actually go about designing and implementing metrics for your applications. So remember how I said that Prometheus uses a pull-based model? What this actually means is that your R app, that open metrics will add a, a, a slash metrics endpoint to your R application. You'll also have to tell Prometheus where to find your application, but that's a little bit outside of the scope of this talk. But I can show you what Prometheus sees. Because the slash metrics endpoint is just a regular HTTP endpoint, we can query what our app is doing using regular R tools like the DHTR package. And if you do so, this is what you'll see for something like a Plumber API. It's a little bit intimidating at first, but actually this is the text-based format for Prometheus and it's surprisingly easy to read. You can pick out important information like the human readable help strings and the type of metric being used. I actually think that one of the reasons Prometheus has been successful is because it's so easy to look at the text output and kind of suss out if your application is reporting the right things or not. Now, if this is a little intimidating, coming up with your own custom metrics, there is some good news, which is a central goal of the open metrics package has always been ease of use with existing R application frameworks. So right now that means there's built-in support for Shiny and Plumber. Uh, if you're using Shiny already, you can add useful metrics to your application just by calling register Shiny metrics. It gives you a bunch of defaults. The same thing is true for Plumber. You can call register Plumber metrics with your Plumber router and get a bunch of useful default metrics. Now, because this is a goal of the project, I'm also interested in further community contributions for other R, popular R frameworks. Uh, in particular, I'd love to see support for something like HTTR or other curl-based packages. And in addition to that, I do think that there's room for improvement on the existing built-in metrics. Now, I've emphasized that Prometheus uses this pull-based model, but for some things, this is kind of inconvenient. A good example of this is if you have, uh, say, automated R markdown reports that run regularly, and you might want to collect metrics on how those reports run, but generally they aren't around long enough for Prometheus to be taught where they are and to scrape them. And the same is true of the kind of stuff you would make cron jobs with, or say, R-based ETL. 
The Prometheus community actually does have an answer for this. There's an application called the Prometheus Push Gateway. And this supports a simple API so that you can push metrics from applications that need it. And then Prometheus itself will scrape Push Gateway. The basic idea is that at the top of your script, you define a bunch of metrics, and then you set an exit handler so that these metrics are pushed to Push Gateway when your script ends. And then you do your regular script stuff using the metrics, using the metrics as you wish. So this presentation wouldn't be complete if I didn't do some sort of demo. But because uh, this is a pre-recorded talk, I can do something a little bit more dangerous than I might otherwise be able to. So uh, I'm going to show you some live production demo or some live production dashboards. I've modified them a little bit to um, occlude potentially proprietary information, but they should give you a pretty good idea of the things you can do. Prometheus itself actually includes very limited UIs for creating graphs, and certainly no UI for creating dashboards. So it's actually overwhelmingly common to pair it with a tool called Grafana, which is an open source dashboarding and alerting solution that can query Prometheus and actually many, many other data sources. So the examples I'll show today are actually dashboards made with Grafana, which query Prometheus, which, are, which is scraping your R application. So in this example, I'm actually gonna use one of our stream processing workflows, which basically takes in data, does some work on it, and spits it back out again. So over here on the top left-hand corner, you can see we've got a measure of activity. So those are the payloads that are coming in, which have various categories. You also have a measure of latency. That's how long it actually takes to do this work. And if you look really closely, it takes about 70 milliseconds on average, but one in a hundred payloads takes 500 milliseconds to process. So maybe we need to take a look at improving that time. For this particular application, we also care a lot about network latency, which is why we have a dedicated panel measuring this latency. We also have traditional measures like CPU usage, as well as memory. Memory is not very useful in this case, but CPU is a good proxy for activity. And finally, we do have an useful application specific metric, which is that these operations often need to look up metadata from an external source. We want that to be as fast as possible, so we cache it as much as possible. And so this really just shows what percentage of the lookups are cached versus needing to go out for real data. And hopefully that gives you an indication of what's possible. So that's a broad overview of what you can do with the open metrics package today. But one of the reasons that this is kind of an exciting space is that there have been important developments in the Prometheus community only in the past six months or so. These are intimately tied to the fact that finally, after three years in development, the open metrics specification itself was finally released to the public. And this has created a huge burst of activity around various clients and vendors implementing new features of the specification that don't exist in the current Prometheus data format. Biggest new thing is the introduction of the concept of exemplars, which I like to think of as effectively asking Prometheus, can you give me an example? And to illustrate this, suppose you have a plumber application. If you looked at a dashboard or an alert, it might tell you something like, in the last hour, there have been 221 errors, to which you respond something like, Great, I guess that there's a problem. But that doesn't usually give you a very good place to start. An exemplar might say, including one with request ID, blah, or trace ID, blah, or customer ID, blah. And this is really useful because it gives you a starting point to help track down these issues. This gives you something to search your logs for, or maybe search other internal systems search logs of other applications. Maybe you can check in your database for a particular customer ID. Maybe that's part of the issue. 
And that's because exemplars, by and large, are really about improving the integration of metrics with other systems that help us observe and understand and keep applications running smoothly. Overall, I think this is a really positive development for the Prometheus format. And I think over the next few years, we'll see a lot of excitement and activity around those features. And it would be great if our users could be part of that. And that's all the time I have. So as I mentioned, the Open Metrics package is available on CRAN. There's also a package down website if you're interested in that. The development version on GitHub does contain some goodies that aren't yet available on CRAN, but that probably won't be true by the time you see this. Hopefully, the Open Metrics package can help you increase your confidence that your R code or application can be effectively monitored in production and help bring more reliable value to your company or organization. It's my belief that as production use of R grows, expectations around production features of R, such as monitoring and metrics and alerting, will grow as well. I'm Aaron Jacobs. You can find me on Twitter, on GitHub, or on my own site. I work at Crescendo Technology in Toronto, and if this piques your interest, we are generally always hiring. Thanks for watching, and I hope you check out many of the other great talks at this year's user. Hey, thank you so much, Aaron, for that talk. It looks like really interesting work. I can totally see how this would be very useful. I think we only have time for one pretty straightforward question, but I'm going to pose one from Steffi Groth. Could you say a bit about what the default metrics are for a Shiny app? Yeah, so I didn't I didn't mention this in the talk. Specifically right now, we can do things like track how many users are using a session. Um, there's also some metrics around how long it's taking reactives to flush, which sounds kind of technical, but it, it will basically tell you if your Shiny app's getting stuck. Um, we also track things like uh, CPU usage, memory usage, um, there's also some stuff around uh, something weirdly technical again called file descriptors, but that can be super useful to know if you're, if, if, for example, you have too many database connections open or you're leaking database connections. Um, but as I said in the talk, I, I don't think that the, the metrics for Shiny are perfect. And partly that's because Shiny is a little bit hard to hook into, um, but I think that they can probably be improved in the future. And, and I, certainly, I think that they give you a, a starting point. For us, for us internally, we often add custom metrics for Shiny apps in particular. For the particular app, yeah. yeah. All right, well, thank you again, Aaron. And we're going to move on to our second talk now, which will also be um, a video, but our speaker is with us. So we're about to hear about automating business processes with R from Franz van Dunay. Hello, thank you very much for your interest in this talk. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to be talking about automated business processes with R. And I'm very happy that there is such a session as R in the wild, uh, you know, to talk a little bit about the other things that uh, we do or people do with R, I'm one of them. Um, it's a sponsored talk. We are very happy as Expandia to be one of the sponsors of USAR uh, Global 2021. And my name is Franz van Dunay. I'm the Chief Data Officer at Expantia, and if there's any questions that I could answer, uh, you know, after this talk or anything else that you might come up, please feel free to contact me. So, uh, in the next uh, 15 minutes, what I will uh, talk about is a data-driven innovation. Right, Data-driven innovation is a process that we found helps organizations to quickly adapt to change, something that has been necessary in the, in the last uh, year and a half more than ever before because of the pandemic. Um, things that we have found are things that I want to share with you because they might be, it might be of use. So first of all, uh, APIs are really excellent tools to uh, reuse existing uh, tools that you have within your organization. Um, that allows you to innovate without having, you know, extensive uh, additional investments that you need to make. Um, this having data scientists or analysts or just people tinkering with R come up with new ideas um, may impact the, the the interaction that you will that they have with um, uh, with IT. So uh, that is part of what what will come up in this talk. At the end of the, you know, at the end of things, the the main 
message I want to convey is that domain experts, you know, with the help of R, uh, really can impact the top line in organizations. Uh, we only need to let them do it. Um, we need to let them do it, but then we also need to monitor um, the results of their activities and make sure that we have the metrics in place uh, that we can evidence whatever, whatever success they've had or not. The way that we do this in Expantia is using a process that we call the data-driven innovation process. It has the following steps. We start off with a common frame of reference, right? We need to be sure that everybody is talking about the same thing. Um, concepts like big data are notorious for everybody having their own idea about what that might mean. Same goes for machine learning, even worse, artificial intelligence. So if we sense that that is not in place yet within the, the customer where we're going to work at, uh, we offer workshop to, to help, you know, people come, come together in how to see things and how to interpret things. Having that, we map data sources within the organization. It's a full map of everything that is there, including the formal and the informal data sources, so that we know what, what the basis is for um, uh, answering business questions that have priority. When we present the data map, we also make the inventory of those, made, of those priority uh, questions uh, to make sure that people can um, uh, give us the boundaries within which we do the exploratory data analysis, right? You can go and explore data for a long time, but we need to know that we are actually adding value to, to the organization. And in that same meeting, we select typically three of the many data sources that we have to get an idea of what, the, um, what is available within uh, within the organization. Based on that, we go out into the, um, you know, we, we talk to people and we make an inventory of opportunities. Could be a list of 30, could be a list of, uh, you know, 100 different opportunities that we prioritize according to criteria that I will show you in the next slide. And when we have that, we, can, we draft up a report uh, that we call the innovation route, um, where we pick the top three opportunities and give an idea on how we could execute them. Now, the inventory of opportunities is basically the Christmas list of each and every one uh, within the organization, um, uh, what, they, what they want, where they see opportunities to innovate. And what we do is we put them, you know, we compare them to, well, what are the, what is the strategic value or what could the strategic value be of this particular initiative? Uh, and is it aligned to strategic objectives within the organization? What is the scope, right? How many people or how many areas will, will it touch when we, uh, when we are able to deploy? How feasible is it? And can we do it with a small investment or is it something that takes a lot of time and a lot of money? Um, and we look at the availability of data and the accessibility of data, right? It's great to have data, but if we cannot access it, if we cannot use it for uh, analysis, well, there's not much uh, value to it. So having that, um, you know, you could imagine an example like this. This was with a, a consulting company who had the typical um, impact of the pandemic where usually they organize events, they invite a lot of people, uh, they present something uh, fun and exciting, and then, you know, they said, start building on the, on the customer relationship. With the pandemic and the absence of these kinds of events, what happened is that they switched to webinars. To their surprise, they worked really well, right? The first one had like a thousand people uh, in, uh, in uh, the first call. Um, and Zoom gives you the option to download data of the participants, including how long they stayed to watch the, um, uh, to watch the show, to watch the webinar. Uploading that data to the CRM then gives a better overview of the potential customer because we get to know a little bit about their interests. And then the combined um, uh, data that we have from the CRM, uh, historical Zoom data, allows us with R uh, to do a customer segmentation. And based on the customer segmentation, we can upload groups for specific email uh, targeted messages uh, for to invite them to the next webinar that might interest them or give them, uh, you know, uh, uh, an offer that is targeted at, on them. But it takes time, 
So here a person is downloading, is working on the Zoom data to make sure that it fits in the CRM. In the CRM, we need to create a report, we download it, we need to tweak with it to uh, run the R script. Then based on the R script, we do the uploading to the email marketing platform. It, if you want to do it regularly, it gets cumbersome. So that is where automation comes in, right? And with R, there's a lot that we can do because in each of these steps between these, uh, these applications, we can make use of APIs. APIs are application programming interfaces. And in essence, it's a set of instructions that each of these software packages have so that we can make a call to get information. And we can make a, um, a, a post to put information inside the next, uh, the next um, um, link in the chain. By doing that, we, we cut out the, the, the handwork by people who need to download, do things, etc. It uh, speeds up the process and it also helps us avoid you know, common, common copy-paste um, copy -paste mistakes. I mentioned get and post because it means that for each of the applications, we need to go to the documentation and see that, uh, for instance, in Zoom, we can do a get uh, past webinars, webinar ID, and get a list of participants. In our email uh, platform, we may be able to do a post so that we can send off uh, the groups, name, email, uh, and whatever, you know, what, whatever other characteristics we need to specify to get the correct message to them, and do that on a daily or weekly basis, fully automized. Now, automation in, um, has usually been the, the domain of IT. Right, so there's a group of IT, and they they are in control um, of everything that has to do with access to data sources, user authentication, servers, uh, database infrastructure, uh, cloud-based services of different kinds, and suddenly we get a group of of analysts, um, and sometimes not, not even formally analysts, but domain uh, knowledge holders who just have a good idea, and know how to execute it. Uh, that are working on reports and uh, maybe in our markdown they uh, figured out how to send out uh, automated emails they make interactive dashboards um, start playing with containers in languages that usually on the IT side are not so common like R but, but also Python, Julia, there are others. In our experience this tension does, does commonly exist and one way to um, mitigate whatever friction that might cause is to uh, help both sides understand that the analysts can package their R code or their uh, Python code in APIs, right? In R, we would do that with Plumber. Uh, take code that runs from sequentially from top to bottom, and there is more than enough documentation online to take that to a um, plumber API so that whatever IT is working with, maybe Java, maybe .NET, they can make the calls to those APIs and um, R becomes completely invisible to them. Really, it doesn't matter. It's just one more service within the whole architecture of services within the organization. Um, dash, dashboards similarly can play a role in, you know, closing down the, the narrowing the, the playing field um, where we do not depend on anybody else, like for instance, a BI organization to make the dashboard for our data or uh, in the case of R and Shiny, you know, it's, it's so easy to make really bespoke uh, made to measure um, interfaces that it usually helps to, to do that um, in, the, uh, in the interaction and communication. The key to this is the library Hatter or HTTR or however you pronounce it. Um, and the get and the post uh, functions are uh, the ones that we use most, right? Get to get data, post to put it somewhere else. We've even um, uh, published the, the packages that we use in-house, like the one we use with our CRM, uh, less annoying CRM, and uh, the one we use with our um, project configuration tool, which is called Giti. Um, they're both wrappers around the APIs that those, those software um, packages provide. And if you're interested in how a package that would be used internally within an organization, what that looks like, please feel free to visit our GitHub. If you just want to use them, you can download them from CRAM. They're both uh, published there. In general, what we see is that if you take small steps, 
uh, but you measure and you keep communicating with the rest of the organization, um, learn from experience, then do it again and again and again, uh, making sure that you have impact, the kind of impact that you want to have, and that that is a very sound strategy to uh, to implement um, uh, innovation. Um, and you, you know, we've we found R to be a very useful tool to do that. One recommendation is that as soon as you start to automate processes, uh, make sure that you start to automatically monitor them as well. Uh, this is a very simple, um, you know, shiny dashboard that we use. Uh, unfortunately, I see now that it is the, the template. So, you know, there's nothing, nothing running. Um, but you can imagine that for each of the processes running daily, weekly, monthly, hourly, whatever frequency you have set up, uh, that being able to see that the last run was okay in red, uh, sorry, in green, um, helps a lot to identify when something goes wrong in red. We set the um, processes up uh, not as uh, our scripts running, but as our markdown um, documents running every hour, every month, so that whenever something goes wrong, if you press on CDHTML, you can see exactly where the process stops. In some cases, we've even uh, you know, included some, uh, some validation or some testing steps, so that it becomes more easy to identify whatever went wrong and so that you can go to the right place to, um, to fix it. So um, what I try to, to share with you in the, in the last uh, 14 minutes is that, you know, first of all, you need, you need a common frame of reference. You need to know, you need to be sure that you're talking about the same thing as the persons in your team uh, and the people, the stakeholders in your organization. It's very important. Every step here will help with that as well, right? Um, it is useful to have a map of all the data sources that are available. And I guarantee that once you start making the list, there will be some data sources coming up that somebody else has had not seen before, right? There will be surprises. Make sure that you include the informal ones, you know, like the one Excel that is calculating um, how uh, customer segmentation or I don't know what the Excel does, but very often they exist. Do exploratory analysis in close contact with knowledge holders, right? It's very easy to sort of retreat to, uh, to your ivory tower and start uh, working on, um, uh, you know, on what might be there. But what you might find interesting might not be interesting at all in a business context. So making sure that you do that in close communication will help uh, to get better results. It's also more fun uh, because the, the data that you're handling uh, has meaning. And with that, organize go, no go meetings. So present your findings of your exploratory data analysis and be forward, be honest about what you will be and will not be able to do. If there's not enough signal in the data to make a predictive model, then recommend no go and recommend do something else, right? Don't, don't get stuck on somebody wanted a model of, of such and such a phenomenon when there might be other things that um, are more helpful to uh, work out first. When you uh, want to make an inventory of opportunities, make sure you interview key stakeholders in the widest sense in the organization, you know, as time allows. Prioritize those opportunities and suggest how to execute them. And last, but certainly not least in this conference, um, the more people share a common language to access data like R, the more opportunities you will seize. Right. It seems it seems very obvious, but we've see, really seen this happen uh, because suddenly somebody in, uh, I don't know, in, uh, in a commercial um, position tinkering with R will come up with something that you might not have thought of. Uh, and you can take that as an idea and as an analyst, as an R programmer, make that much better than what it perhaps was in the first iteration. Um, but it's it's that it's you know take an idea, working on it, making it better, and then going in the next iteration again. So thank you very much. Um, if there's anything uh, I can help you with uh, in the question and answering session, I think we have got a few minutes, and I uh, hope to somehow meet with you uh, again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Franz, for that. I assume you'll um, unmute and reveal yourself. Um, so we have about two minutes before we move on. And so a question I have for you is, 
when you go into an organization and you're trying to help them make better use of data, I would love to know if you have great examples of something you often do for people that has a great ratio of how hard it is versus how delighted they are once, once something has happened or the opposite. What's something that everybody asks for, everyone thinks they want, everyone thinks they need, and then they get it and their world is actually not any different. So can you comment on either of those? Sure. The first one is, um, there's maybe, it's one of two. It's, it's uh, making a, a report that people might be used to, you know, they, they work on that for, for sometimes two or three weeks to create a report, take that um, and turn it into an R markdown. The fact that you, with the press of a button, take the last cut out of, uh, you know, the a date cut out of a database and then have the full report with all the graphs and everything else in, you know, in just, uh, just a minute is, is amazing. And very close to that is the availability of R um, sending out email, right? So the, the Blastula package is, is absolutely fantastic. It's some, but something that very few people think of before they start on analytics and whatnot. It's that part of communication and it tends to make people very happy. The other one, uh, Jenny, is a little bit, little bit harder to answer. And... Um, yeah, I, so I, I don't want to shoot myself on my own feet, but it's like the, the sometimes the managing the expectations around uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning models uh, really is, is, you know, is part of what we do to make sure that the appropriate expectations are said that everybody shares them and that, uh, you know, all these visions of glass, um, how do you call that magic balls uh, disappear before we actually start is I think one of the hardest parts of what we, uh, what we need to do. All right. That's great. I, nothing terribly shocking there, but I do the, the magic of having a report that used to be produced through painful manual processes become automated is great. Well, thank you again. We're going to move on to our third talk talk now, which will be delivered live. Um, it's on our studio managed workbench, and we will be hearing from Patrick Schratz from Synchra. Yes, thanks, Jenny, for the introduction. Let me share my slides with you, or in more detail, my browser. So, um, yeah, managed workbench. Um, I'm talking on behalf of Synchra, and I want to introduce our comprehensive R Studio infrastructure what we can offer to any kind of um, organization, whether it's small size, medium size, or large size organization, to really enhance um, the way you, your data science teams work uh, with our studio products. So, but before, um, to, uh, before I go into detail of our product, let's talk a bit about who we are actually. So we are really a small team um, based in Zurich in Switzerland. Um, we are quite young. We were founded in 2018 by Kira Miller and Christoph Sachs. Um, and we are quite international. So we are currently um, five to 10 people from seven different countries. We have a strong open source philosophy in everything we do. And we are um, an official R Studio certified partner. So um, we went into training with our studio and do everything with R from in, in all of what we do. Um, some of our um, clients that we are uh, already working with uh, are successfully are listed on the right side and we mainly do consulting for them. Um, this is one of our um, yeah, big, big tasks that we do all day. Uh, we also give our studio uh, our stats workshops in general and we also write a lot of our packages. Uh, so 50% um, of our work is really contributing to the open source community, especially R, making everything better, um, easier, and uh, more accessible. And the other part is where a studio managed workbench then comes in. Um, so we deploy um, and maintain the infrastructure for these clients so they can really um, have a great environment for data analysis and everything they want to do with R. And then we can optionally also assist them um, in this environment. So um, to 
give you a basic introduction about our studio and their product lineup in case um, you're not fully aware of it. There are quite some products our studio offers. Um, they, they are free and products and licensed products. So let's say we, we have the free products on the left, the um, our studio desktop that uh, most of you are familiar with, um, the Shiny server and the basic our studio server. And on the right, they are the equivalents for the on the enterprise level. So, for example, for the Studio Desktop, there would be our Studio Desktop Pro, uh, which um, combines very nicely with the R Studio Workbench here, which is the um, license equivalent of our Studio Server. And then in there is our Studio Connect, uh, which is um, the professional product uh, to the Shiny server. And in the last one here on the right is the R Studio Package Manager, which you can use to build your binaries for your local internal packages, for example, or just in general make use of um, binaries on Linux or um, CRAN binaries on Linux. Uh, if you want to see more details between the free and the licensed version, just um, yeah, uh, you can click the link up here. You see also for the slides, and then check out these links on the bottom left. Um, coming to our studio uh, professional products in more detail, because this is what our offering and, and the product in the end is about and based on. So as you might know, our studio Workbench, which was recently rebranded to Workbench before it was our studio server pro connect and the package manager, they form the bundle, the R studio team bundle, which is really the enterprise, um, product that can help to really push your data science team um, onto the next level coming from a normal R Studio desktop use. So by being a centralized installation, um, they can really take a lot of time away from um, installing and maintaining R Studio local installations on every of your on every laptop of your um, team member. And they simplify permission handling, you have centralized logins and so forth. So this is all great. The downside is that um, this usually requires quite some configuration in the first place. So um, deploying such a central service, you really need to ensure that it's stable, that it's um, always available, that the configuration with the um, authentication is just working. Um, and this is usually not done um, in a few hours. So that's our experience. And we've seen lots of people trying to do it themselves and really struggling and then maybe getting frustrated and things are not working as they wished. And then there's a very great and detailed admin guide, um, but this is really also sometimes very techy. So we are there to help. So we know the pain and we want to take the pain away and just, just make everything easy. Um, and this is where our idea and um, added value product on our studio um, professional product comes in. So we call it managed workbench. Um, and, uh, a lot of details are also listed on our website. Um, if you click on here, sync.com or studio, you see a lot of more details on it. Um, I'll walk you through most of the important points that, uh, our, our solution has to offer. So first of all, it's containerized. And so we have a Docker image. Um, and not just for our studio workbench, but for all st our studio products that are out there. So even though we call it a managed workbench, because this is really the centerpiece and to our, in our experience, that's what most people want to have. Um, you can have everything what our studio offers. These are uh, Docker images always ship, of course, with the last version of each product. They are centrally managed and updated by us. Everything is configured. Um, they run on in an Ubuntu. Um, LPS environment, so you will always be um, in a very common, maybe the most common Linux environment out there. And this will stay no matter what your company is, is using in the background as an operating system. So uh, things will usually just work. We have a lot of experience with all kind of authentication protocols that are out there that your company might use. Active Directory, LDAP, local users, SAML, OIDC. So there's a lot out there. And to our experience, everybody uses something else. 
So some for historic reasons, um, some might change uh, in the meantime and companies and organizations won't switch to a new one. And usually this is, comes always with some trouble. And uh, if you want to get things uh, properly set up and really stable, um, this is where the pain comes in and where you usually it's nice to have help there. And another thing we realized um, uh, when working um, and helping people with R is that sometimes uh, Pandoc and Latish um, can be a trouble. So um, this differs from operating system to operating system again. And by having an um, a, a installation based on Ubuntu LTS, Latish and Pandoc, uh, we just ensure that both are working. Um, this takes away a lot of pain, especially when rendering our markdown and other interactive documents. So um, no worries about anymore about these kind of um, yeah, rendering issues. Uh, the next thing is security. So we uh, um, couple our installations with an Nginx Rios proxy in front to really make sure there's a proper load balancing for the web server and incoming requests and also set proper security headers to make sure everything's just safe. In addition to the simple installation of, of the product and making sure that there are smart defaults in place, uh, we also um, provide additional helpers that uh, for, for everybody out there, not just for, for people that uh, would like to have this kind of um, pre-configured um, RStudio Workbench, but to everyone. Um, and as we said, we are very devoted to open source in our company and to um, we have a lot of R packages out there for the community. And one of this that couples very nicely with this idea of having kind of small helpers and smart defaults to make our Studio Life DVD series Syncra this. And, and Syncra this is um, here a small package that comes, for example, with a lot of R end helpers that makes a certain certain small um, re recurring tasks easier. Our Studio Connect helpers and some other things you might be you might find useful for for daily product uh, project life. Um, you can check out the package here. It's it's uh, you see the URL at the top, but you can also certainly find it easily on on GitHub at uh, um, at github.com slash syncra. Yeah, what else do we have? So um, we ha also. Um, have um, um, by default and configuration of our workbench installation coupled with an RStudio package manager. So we, by default, just uh, users make use of, of package binaries on Linux because we're running on Ubuntu set uh, these options as the repo options and the installations. The users will just have a very, very quick installation of any package that's available on CRAN. Um, so, for example, if I go in here in the RStudio Workbench and um, spin up a session here, let's assume the last one. That's our internal RStudio Workbench um, instance here. And let's say we install a package. Um, let's do a, a simple one. Um, you will see what happens. It just downloads. Even with our Linux. Um, we're downloading it from, from an RSPM that we can, in this case, this is our internal Syncra RSPM, but you could also have it um, and use the global RSPM from our studio or even host your own one. And you just saw how quick that was, right? There's no compilation from source or other things. You will always just download the binaries. And if you install Tidyverse, it's done even if, if uh, within one minute, even if you have no package available beforehand. So it's, it's, just, it's just working. As, as you wish. And yeah, we ship with uh, any R version starting from 3.6.3 uh, as the long-term support. But if you need older versions, uh, it would also be no problem. So um, let's go back here in our instance. In the dropdown, for example, you see what current R versions we have available. And this will just continue to uh, with all the new R versions coming out in the future. and. Um, but anything is possible here, so you can just quickly change between any R versions, or there's really no trouble for your um, members of, of your team to use any R version they want to have. 
So um, if you're still not convinced, let's look at some production setups um, that might convince you to, to get help when you're thinking about um, deploying our studio products yourself. So these are kind of really some examples in the wild that um, we, we have seen in the past. So people and, and organizations also like to combine the workbench with other products, for example, Connect, Package Manager. Sometimes they do not. Sometimes they have another open, our, uh, open source, our studio server running as a backup. Sometimes they use a shiny server instead of connect. And everybody really has different um, SSO types for logging in OIDC or SAML, or everybody uses different database drivers. And this is really when it becomes really a custom installation where you really need to narrow it down to your specific setup. And this, this really takes time in, um, in our experience. And this is where we can help, where we have the experience and where we really uh, like to make things easier for you. Uh, we built everything in drone and Gitty. So we built, have this Docker um, set up to, to build everything. In the end, we have an, a, a custom client image just for you that includes the drivers you need, that includes the services you need, and, and only ships uh, everything in a, in a simple bundle just tailored to your organization that just works. So we based everything off a Syncra um, Ubuntu image here that we've um, a snapshot it from uh, um, Ubuntu 2004 uh, snapshot, and then we just have this, this image inheritance and we cherry pick from each Im image and put it into the next one. Yeah, um, you see a lot of like, uh, well, kind of a table on comparison table between our studio desktop, our studio workbench and our solution. Uh, so this kind of, this is a summary of, of um, our added value to the default R Studio Workbench installation that um, yeah should should uh, um, make it clear oh sorry make it clear where uh, our product really tries to be smart and have smart defaults and just working out of the box working configuration. Um, in addition, we have kind of a we have made a comparison with the settings we applied for the startup speed between an RStudio uh, workbench setup here on the left and a normal RStudio desktop installation on the left. And you see that uh, the left one is kind of a few seconds faster, even though um, this was benchmarked on a, on a very recent MacBook Pro, which is quite fast. Um, so this is quite um, impressive, I'd say. Um, because if you take all the laptops or if your company has all the laptops, then this difference might be even, even higher. Also with the RSPM, if you host your own RSPM, for example, here, you can get a um, increase in download speed of, of up to four times. For example, here we have, uh, we are downloading the GH package from our own RSPM and we are at 0 0.09 seconds. Whereas from the global RStudio package manager, we are at 0 0.4 seconds. And this is, Mainly because of um, uh, the uh, the fact that uh, we can we are able to host uh, the, our RS, RSPM on a local machine near next to us with a very good um, network connection. Whereas, of course, if you would use the, the global RStudio package manager, which is perfectly fine, right? Um, the, the travel distance would be a bit longer. So and so these are the small the small um, techie um, things that uh, we can also offer to, to um, really take out uh, or get out the most of, out of our studio product. Uh, yeah, um, so that's what we do. Um, that's what we can help you with. We would like to really make things easier for you. If you're thinking about our studio products, we, we have a lot of experience setting them up, doing everything from A to Z, the whole environment. Um, the whole DevOps part that um, you don't want to do yourself usually, and it's very a pain if you do it yourself. Be happy to cooperate with any IT um, of your organization. Um, and usually it, it works out great because they're happy they're not doing it alone, and we are happy to, to assist them to make everything smooth. And um, if you want to find us, you can find our web pages here or LinkedIn and also find us on GitHub. So. Um, yeah, happy to take any questions. Um, and we are also hiring. So um, just hit us up if you're interested in, in how we do things and how we work. All right, thanks. Thank you, Patrick. The, the, 
the note you ended on is actually what I wanted to ask about. So, you know, I do work for our studio, but nowhere near the pro products side. And so I kind of lurk in some channels where I get to see some of this, but, but at arm's length. So I'm wondering, like, when you go in to help someone stand all of this up, is it usually because they don't really have that kind of IT support or there is IT support in the organization, but they don't want to install our studio or like sort of how does, who, who are the typical sort of organizations that would um, use a managed product like that? Yeah, that's a good question, Shani. Thanks. So it usually differs, but what we see most is that uh, organizations have a IT support, but this IT support is um, has not any experience yet with R. So most of companies are started with R or they have used it at local or studio desktop installation yet. And then maybe they get the request, oh, we want to build a centralized studio um, uh, infrastructure at ours. And then they see, well, um, boy, it's not so easy maybe, and it's kind of complicated. And there's this huge admin guide, well, can we get any help? And this is really where we then can jump in and um, make the experience that this makes things easier and better for everybody. And um, yeah, this, uh, this probably answers hopefully the question. Yeah. All right. Well, it's, it's time to move on, but thank you again very much for this talk and for this product. And our final speaker is Joe Rickert from our studio. So he's my colleague and he will be talking to us um, a little bit about our studio. So I'll hand it over to Joe now. Hello everyone. It's really good to be here at USAR. And um, many of you may know me from my work with the R Consortium. But today I'm here with my uh, RStudio hat on, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about our company. So first off, um, well, what is a company? Well, it's people with a mission, a culture, a product, a plan, and, and hopefully some customers. So here you see uh, the smiling, Joe, happy Joe, face. Yes. Joe, you're not sharing your slides. I don't know if you mean to be. Please. Yep, there we go. Sorry about the barking people. Oh, well, I apologize. So now you see the, some of the smiling, happy faces of my colleagues. When I started here uh, in 2016, there were only about 40 of us. And I am um, really, um, it's gratifying to be part of such a, uh, a large and growing group of competent people who are, uh, just have a tremendous amount of energy. And um, we're, we're all remote workers, or most of us are. Uh, we're spread out all over the United States and um, developing a growing footprint around the rest of the world. Uh, we deliberately uh, try to seek diversity and we're trying to take a, a global perspective on everything. You can see in the corner there, we have a small office in Boston, but I bet most our studio employees have never been there. So this is our mission, and, and I'm going to read this slide because it's important, and it's the one thing I really want you to take away from this presentation. Our mission is to create free and open source software for data science, scientific research, and technical, technical communication in a sustainable way. Why? Because it benefits everyone when the essential tools to produce and consume knowledge are available to all, regardless of economic means. So that's, um, that's quite a mission, and we're trying to um, develop the culture and sustain the culture to accomplish that mission. Uh, the one word that I think um, best characterizes what we do is the ancient Greek word eudaimonia, flourishing. So we're always internally asking ourselves, how can we fit into the ARC ecosystem? How can our company flourish while helping our employees, our customers, and the community flourish also? And how can we do this over the long run? Internally at our studio, we talk about being a hundred year company. So what do we need to do in order to, um, to last that long and to try to keep focused on our mission and our culture over that period of time? 
And a significant step we took in 2019 was to become a public benefit corporation. You know, what this means really is that the management of our studio um, not only uh, is allowed to, but has the obligation to consider um, the interest of our share, um, customers, our employees, and the community uh, in addition to the shareholders. So that's very different from the legal um, hierarchy of, of what a normal INC is, a normal incorporated company in the United States. And um, we all, not only uh, took this step legally, but we are um, qualified as a certified B Corp. That means there's a nonprofit that audits every year on how well we are doing uh, with respect to other public benefit corporations and with respect to how well we are achieving our own goals. So open source, it's the center of what we do. Uh, over 50% of our engineering resources were to devoted to open source last year. Uh, we have lots of our studio open source projects and we contribute heavily to other open source activities. For instance, we're strong supporters of the R Consortium where I spend most of my time. We support a number of um, GNOME Focus projects. And the graph on the bottom shows that um, how well we're trying to do with integrating communi uh, community participation in what we're doing. So both of those graphs uh, for Tidyverse on the left and Shiny on the right show project commits over time from 2017 to uh, I guess the beginning of this year. The dark blue shows uh, the commits done by our studio employees, but you can see in, in both graphs, there's a healthy and growing number of commits being made by non our studio people, um, interested people from the community. This is a slide that um, Hadley Wickham uh, presented recently at an internal R Studio meeting. So you can see Hadley up there on the left, along with the seven and a half smiling faces of the Tidyverse team. Uh, predict, you know, a tremendously productive group. You can see some measurements there, over 230 packages. In the month before Hadley gave his talk, there were something like 66 million collective downloads. And that is all accomplished um, using the goals that, that uh, Hadley and the team have set for themselves. And what they're trying to do is provide a seamless end-to-end -end data science experience uh, to help our users um, flourish and to build an ecosystem. So again, it's about contributing and taking a long run view of things. If you go to our webpage, um, this is what you'll see in terms of products. You'll see open source on the left, um, hosted services like RStudio Cloud. That means that there's usually a free component in addition to a, um, something you pay for. And there are professional projects, uh, products, which uh, Patrick did an excellent job of uh, providing an overview. So I don't, I'm not going to go into the much detail uh, there, but I will share this with you. And this is, um, this is my view of what we do here at our studio. So we build tools for data scientists. And our, our data scientists, they build things like on the left block, and that means building models, analyzing um, the results of um, statistical modeling. They publish things. That means sharing uh, all kinds of artifacts, uh, publishing reports and, and models and, and bits of uh, pieces of code. And they do that while collaborating. So when we're building these professional tools and the open source tools too, we have this in mind that we have to build things that help data scientists, our customers, our open source users build to publish and help them collaborate while they're doing this. So um, Patrick talked about the workbench. I'll just mention this as a really good example of a professional project that's all about 
um, helping with the building process. Our Markdown is an open source um, tool that is really fundamental to the whole concept of um, the original mission of, of open source and, and providing a way of, um, of facilitating and help statistical compu uh, computing and, and, and uh, collaboration among data scientists and statistician flourish over the long run. So this is a fundamental tool. And I'll think that you'll see this thing develop over the years and it'll be, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a root kind of thing from which other ideas flow. And then I offer you RStudio Connect as an example of a collaboration tool, a professional collaboration tool. It's a platform, you can publish R and Python and shiny artifacts, and you can do this in a way that uh, facilitates secure and, and managed collaboration. Now here, this is the secret RStudio business plan. So this is, this is the secret hiding in uh, plain sight. And it really talks about how we go about our daily business. So here we are, our studio. And we think about first contributing to the open source community. So this is the, this is the, the real secret. Um, I um, had the opportunity to attend a um, entrepreneurial investment uh, conference not too long ago, and there were young entrepreneurs talking about how they were going to leverage open source. No, that's wrong. First, you have to contribute. And then after you've uh, contributed and helped to build the community, then maybe you've got a place where you have some commercial customers who in turn will drive uh, the adoption of open source. And then maybe they'll buy some of your products, which you can reinvest. So this is the virtuous cycle. Uh, contribute first, help the community grow, help other people make money so that maybe they'll buy some of your products and you can have more uh, to do your, uh, your mission, your avowed job of contributing to open source. We have customers. We're really lucky uh, to have over 5,000 active commercial customers, uh, many of them uh, Fortune 100. And what you see here are uh, the logos of some of the customers are really very proud to have and help sustain us and our mission. And that's it. That's just all I have to say about our studio. And um, thank you. I hope to see some of you anyway next year in person at USAR. Thank you, Joe. I, um, I have one question I want to ask of you when you're sort of wearing your R consortium hat. Uh-oh. So maybe when you answer it. Oh, yeah. Switch hat. <laughs> maybe when you answer it, you should give like the 10 minute, or, sorry, the 10 second, like what that is in case people don't know. But what I wanted to know is... Um, are there any projects that the R Consortium has funded in the past that you think like were particularly effective and or are there types of projects that you think are really needed and that you would love to see people pitch to the R Consortium? Okay, so projects. So there, there are two ways that, um, that we develop projects. Um, in the R Consortium. Uh, twice a year, we go out for a call for proposals. And we, um, what we do is have people, you know, send us proposals and, and we fund um, some of them that we think will have a big impact on the community. And um, will, will be something that's sustainable over time. So to answer Jenny's question there, it was um, spatial statistics. Spatial statistics was a, um, was a big winner. We, we provided a little bit of seed money in the beginning. We have um, funded several spatial statistic projects uh, to the tune of um, um, tens of thousands of dollars. 
altogether, uh, since the beginning, the R Consortium has um, put out over 1.3 million in projects like this. But we'd like to think that we really helped spatial statistics to become a um, uh, to become prominent and to make R like the leading place to do that kind of statistics in um, in the uh, open source world. And uh, we also contribute, uh, you know, we fund, um, we take a broad view of infrastructure projects and we fund, uh, for instance, we funded Our Ladies initially with a small grant and we'd like to think that um, we've helped them become um, as successful as they are, uh, to take nothing away from the tremendous drive of Our Ladies all over the world, but we see infrastructure as community infrastructure too. The other kind of thing that we do is um, we we are um, a center for building collaborative working groups. So these are projects that we initiate um, internally, or people will come to us and say, you know, we have a, a working group, and and the the ISC, our technical committee that Hadley heads up, will give a go ahead. And right now we have a lot of collaborative work going on. For instance, as we speak, the R Consortium is um, gearing up to be able to submit a, um, a, a test clinical trial on behalf of uh, some pharmaceutical companies that are collaborating in order to uh, make possible and streamline and shake out the process of what it would be like to do an all our submission to the FDA. So the consortium's the place to go um, for a um, company neutral uh, place to collaborate in, in uh, industries that may otherwise be pretty uh, competitive. All right, those are great. I think those are great examples, yeah, of but I think it helps people understand sort of the point of the consortium and the type of activities that might happen otherwise, but definitely are more successful and have greater impact by um, having, you know, funding or other contributions from something like the consortium. So I think I'm going to take this chance to conclude our session. So Joe, you could stop sharing, or maybe that's going to be imposed on you. Um, and I would like to thank all four of our speakers again. I thought this was a really interesting session. And I love, I think especially because I had the journey I did with R, sort of moving from being an individual data analyst in academia and now working on the Tidyverse team, I find it really interesting to see um, how R is used in production environments because it's not sort of where I grew up with R, um, but I find it very fascinating. All right, so this session, and there's I think three sessions running right now, we are the last sort of regular sessions of USAR 2021. And I'd like to thank the sponsor for this particular session, Roche. And we're gonna end now, you have about 13 minutes by my calculation for a health break. And then there will be the closing ceremony where you hear probably a little bit about the attendance of the conference and all the different platforms that were used and how global it was, maybe some awards and important announcements about the shape and form of Use Art 2022. And I'd also really like to thank our Zoom hosts as well. And I will see you folks soon. Bye-bye.